I, I have a five-year-old daughter and a three-year-old daughter, and they've both discovered that, uh, well, how to put it, they've discovered I'm a, I'm a theologian. Uh, they wouldn't put it in those terms, but they know enough by now to know uh, that dad spends his time talking to people about God. And this has become an uh, important part of the nighttime uh, strategy of delaying bedtime because, uh, well, our oldest daughter, Josephine, has figured out uh, some, for some reason this guy just stops dead in his tracks. I can slow everything down if I start asking questions about God. And um, <laughs> this, this has been incredible, and they're, they're exactly right. I, I'm a sucker every time. Uh, but they were, we, were, we were watching The Little Mermaid the other day, and the, the, uh, the, the question a couple weeks ago was, um, Dad, can Jesus be killed by a sea witch? <laughs> and I, um, I said no. Um, and of course, the question next is, well, why is that the case? Um, well, you know, I start giving answers. None of them are pleasing. And I finally, in exasperation, just say, Josephine, the reason Jesus can't be killed by a sea witch, quite apart from the fact that there are no sea witches, is that he's eternal. And uh, my youngest daughter pops her head around the corner and starts crying and says, I don't want Jesus to be a turtle. Um, I'm telling you that, I told you that because you need to laugh. It's good for you to laugh. The positive psychologists, they tell us so. Uh, I, also, I also bring up my, my children to say, as I was thinking about this talk and how I wanted to proceed uh, and what I wanted to say, uh, one word that came to mind uh, was show and tell. Uh, my, my oldest daughter, she's in kindergarten now, and um, she's always imagining the next thing that she'll take to school to show and to tell. And uh, really what I want to do this afternoon, I, 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 so you have a handout, I hope, is, is to show you a couple of things. Just a couple. And then I want to tell you something about them. Uh, some of the things I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you a lot about. Uh, a couple of the most interesting and shiniest things I'm, I'll say less about at the outset, and maybe we'll get to those uh, in the Q&A. Um, but, but that's, that's my basic idea. And, and the, the two, well, or three, I should say, things with this. First, I want to show you a passage that puts in, uh, in, in crystal clear language exactly what Aquinas means by friendship. And then I want to I show it to you and I want to tell you about it and gloss it with you and help unpack that. It's illuminating and useful. Uh, then I want to just say how it is that, and the, here's the second thing I'll show you, this is this passage where Aquinas then goes on to say, in what sense uh, there is this thing called friendship with God or charity that maximally fulfills this conception of what friendship is. It's not just an example of friendship, it's the, the paragon uh, of friendship, the exemplar upon which every other friendship is in some way founded and measured by. And then I, th the third thing I want to show you um, is a, just a set of passages in which Aquinas says very plainly uh, that this thing called friendship with God, it's not just this contrivance of scholastic theology, it's, a, it's something real and it can be experienced. It's, it's, it, can be, it's, it can be lived. And that's and I think that will, that will take us quite a ways this afternoon. So that's where I want to begin. All right, so uh, the, one, one more thing just by way of preamble. Uh, in the previous talks, uh, there, was some, there were moments where it was necessary to distinguish between a philosophy and theology. And you may have heard uh, Father Dominic say at one point, all right, now we've moved into the realm of theology, um, and I'll, I should just say here at the outset, 
from beginning to end, what I'm, I take myself to be doing here and what I'm inviting you to do with me is, it's theology. All right? That's, importantly, that's important to say. It's different than uh, philosophy uh, in, in, in this sense. When we're doing theology, we are beginning, beginning with uh, principles of faith. All right, now today we've heard something that might be described as certain preamble, preambles to faith. Uh, but it's important that uh, the theologian not try to uh, defend the principles of faith in, in a way that um, reasons toward them. We, we, we take certain things on the basis of faith and then we use philosophy in order to say something about them, in order to make the, the truth within them manifest, in order to make them plain. Uh, all that's just to say is that there are some, we're just beginning here when we get into this discussion of friendship with God uh, with, with something that Aquinas finds in Scripture and he thinks it's true. And um, he thinks that to encounter it is to encounter an invitation to consider its truth. And so, and, and that would be the case for everyone here quite apart from what you believe. So, uh, let me begin now officially asking just the simplest of questions. What is friendship? Uh, I'm go going to read this first passage in full, and then I'm going to, and then we're going to look through it together, and uh, and then and we're going to make sense of it. So, Thomas tells us that according to the philosopher, that's Aristotle, in Ethics eight. Not just any love has the nature of friendship, but only that love which is together with benevolence, when namely we love someone such that we will him good. Now, if we do not will good to what we love, but rather will it's good for ourselves, say in the way that we are said to love wine or a horse or things like that, this is not friendship love, rather it's a kind of yearning. Now, benevolence does not satisfy the nature of friendship, for it also requires a certain mutual love. And since, and this is a quip uh, of sorts, a friend is a friend to a friend. What does that mean? We will we'll say together. And this mutual benevolence, Aquinas continues, must be founded on some kind of sharing. Now, uh, I'm going to... I'm going to nuance that. I've rendered this word here in the Latin communicatio, sharing here. Uh, it's difficult to get into English with just one term. It's better paraphrased than, than um, translated. Uh, I'll say why. In any case, what I'm, I want to show you here is that, um, is first of all, that this is what Aquinas means by friendship. And if we look carefully at the passage, we see that it has basically four parts. This is what friendship c consists in, um, or if this is how we define friendship, think of the definition as having roughly four parts. Okay. Now, the first part specifies that in every friendship worthy of the name true friendship, there's always a certain kind of love involved. So the first thing that has to be done is we have to say what love is. And here's a handy definition that Thomas gets from Aristotle's uh, book on rhetoric, the second, the, uh, the second book in the book on rhetoric. It's that love, or to love rather, is to wish someone some good. To love is to wish someone some good. So. Um, if I say I love you, I'm saying that at, in some respect, there's something I want for you. And it's going to turn out, it's, it's actually quite interesting, uh, uh, and we'll come to this. I mean, there's a big question here about when it comes to friendship. Uh, Aquinas thinks, and the question is, what is it that friends want for each other? Uh, so, if to love is to wish someone some good, 
uh, I've suggested now that there are different kinds of love. Um, Aquinas here notes that, uh, that there's a certain kind of love that um, stands apart from friendship. Uh, it's the kind of love involved when we say things like, I love wine, or I love, I love this horse. All right, uh, let's go with the example of wine. Um, I'm an animal lover, and the example of the horse, it gets complicated. Uh, <clears throat> start with wine. Uh, we love wine. We do. It's, it's good. Uh, and in moderation, it's good for us. <coughs> and when I say that we love wine or that I love wine, what I'm saying uh, is not that uh, I wish this wine some good. What I'm saying is this wine is the good I want for me. Um, Aquinas here is suggesting that it, at least, there are at least many ways in which human beings have related with, hor with horses that go roughly like that. This is a good horse. It's reliable. I love it. Um, it's, it's sturdy. It pulls the, the plow. It's important to me. Uh, it's, it's, when I say I love this horse, I'm saying that this horse is something I want for me. It, it is the thing I will to myself. Uh, all that matters just because Aquinas says what the kind of love involved in true friendship is not this. It's different. The kind of love, well, and let, let's just introduce uh, a, a qualification here, though. In fact, there are kinds of friendship that don't, in Aquinas' view, or mine, or yours, I bet, rise to uh, friendship properly so-called because they actually involve just this sort of love. Uh, you will have encountered people, I'm sorry to say, if you haven't already, you will at some point encounter people who, uh, whose interest in you uh, is in, uh, somehow narcissistically indexed only to them. You show up in their, uh, in their uh, focal awareness, not so much as a person to whom they wish good, but as a good that they wish for themselves. Uh, there are two ways in which this can work. One, we call one of those ways uh, friendships of pleasure. These are drinking buddies. Uh, where the thing that unites the, the, the friends uh, is that they, uh, well, they're not just that they're seeking pleasure, but they are a source of pleasure for one another. But the moment the, they stop being pleasurable to one another, the friendship dissolves. The other is friendships of utility. Uh, I mean, human beings are, we are of use to one another, and this is, there's nothing wrong wrong with that. That's good. It's good that we provide uh, one another with, with benefit in different ways. Uh, there's a certain kind of friendship. It's not quite friendship as we're describing it here, that um, in which the friends will each other some good only insofar as each is useful to the other in some way. Uh, when we're talking about friendship here, we're not talking about friendships of pleasure or friendships of utility. We're talking about friendship properly so-called or what Thomas variously calls true friendship or uh, virtuous friendship. It always involves something besides that kind of love. It's always the kind of love in which each friend is willing the other some good for their own sake. So when Aquinas says here that love, that in every, not just, when he says here, pardon me, not just any love has the nature of friendship, but only that love which is together with benevolence, when namely we love someone such that we will him some good. He's saying that, um, well, benevolence literally just means to will someone some good. 
is using it here synonymously with this notion of friendship love. It's to, to love someone in the precise sense that you're wanting something for them, for their own sake, quite apart from how their flourishing or their enjoyment of that good would uh, pertain to your own well-being. That's the first part. The second part we can, we can take care of a little bit more quickly. It has to do with the object of love. Love for Aquinas is ineluctably personal. It always extends between persons, uh, from one person to another. So, not only uh, is friendship for a horse or for wine something unimaginable in this sense, uh, but, even, but friendship for unquestionably good things like virtue, or acts of virtue, uh, this isn't going to make sense either. Virtue, or virtuous activity, this is something that, uh, that friends can want for each other. I mean, this is, this is what you want uh, for, for people you love. You want them to be courageous and just, and increasingly so. But in that instance, what you're, the virtue is the thing that you're wanting for the friend. It's not the thing that you're loving in the sense of friendship love, as we've just defined. So friendship is always for a person or, or persons. That's the second part. Okay, so third. Uh, all right, now watch this. What does Aquinas say? He says, Now benevolence does not satisfy the nature of friendship, for it also requires a certain mutual love, since a friend is a friend to a friend. What's that mean? All right, now, I'm looking here at many, uh, some familiar faces, but mostly perfect strangers, and say now that um, I want something, I, I love you in the sense that I, there's something I truly want for you some good that I will you. Aquinas is saying that the nature of friendship won't obtain here for a number of reasons, but one important reason is that uh, my well-wishing isn't mutual. So that for a friendship to obtain, you need um, not just one person wishing some other person some good, but you also need that other person wishing the first person that same good, minimally. A lot of this is actually tied up with the fourth part of the definition, and it's here in the last line of the passage. Uh, Aquinas just says very plainly, uh, and this mutual benevolence must be founded on some kind of sharing, some kind of communicatio, some kind of uh, togetherness, some kind of fellowship it might be rendered. Uh, what's that mean and why is it important? Well, uh, think of types of human relation, relations that might, uh, in which the three things I've just named might obtain, but yet, nevertheless, uh, wouldn't count as a kind of friendship. Uh, for some strange reason, I've been thinking of Van Morrison's Astral Weeks, the album. If you don't know it, get it. It's amazing. It's from, it's, it's like, it comes out of nowhere. And I love Van Morrison. I listen to this and I think, wow, that, what a, this is a tremendous person, I, I think, uh, who's, who's made something that is just so, it's, it's like from another planet. Uh, now, imagine that Van Morrison uh, somehow, this would never happen, but hears about Adam Idle and goes and reads some of my scholarly articles and um, this deep affection wells up in Van Morrison for me. 
this also would never happen. Scholarly articles typically don't produce these types of effects in other peop in people, <laughs> um, not least mine. But um, here you have, um, I, I have this general sense of, of affection for Van Morrison. Van Morrison has some general sense of affection for me. We are both wanting something for one another. We are both wanting uh, some general sense of flourishing. Um, and yet Aquinas won't say, and I doubt you will say, that, uh, that we are friends. And that's because um, for there to be a friendship, there has to be some concourse, some togetherness, some living together, some actual sharing in some common pursuit of the thing that we want for one another. Let me try to uh, clarify this a little bit by giving you some examples. Uh, the word friendship for Thomas, as you may be uh, discerning, it can be applied more generally than we typically uh, use it today. So, for example, he'll talk about the fr a, a kind of natural friendship that obtains, say, between brothers. Uh, and he'll say that brothers are united in common origin and upbringing and that they share what he calls a natural communicatio, a natural fellowship. Or he'll say that the members of a household, like think of your roommates right now or the, the people you live with. It, uh, it, it could be your family, your roommates. In, in any case, there's this notion that you're sharing together in what's called a domestic fellowship in Aquinas' language. And that just means that each of you is contributing to procuring the sufficiencies of domestic life. I mean, you're washing, somebody's washing the dishes. I mean, hopefully everyone's taking part in that, but it, they're, you're pursuing something together, some, and where the thing that you're pursuing together is actually living together. That's the thing. Uh, or think of uh, political uh, fellowship. So Aquinas thinks that the members of a political regime are maybe called political friends insofar as they share in a kind of political communicatio, a kind of fellowship. Uh, what's that consist in? Uh, they are all willing each other, uh, the same thing insofar as they're seeking political life, which is just to live together. There's a, but in any case, there's a sharing, a, a kind of togetherness, um, and a mutual pursuit of some cooperative good, some good that couldn't be had or couldn't be had easily uh, without this cooperative enterprise. Okay, it's almost a truism among uh, Aquinas scholars that Aquinas gets this account of friendship from the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, in fact, Aquinas thinks that uh, it can't be just like that. It, insofar as he's doing theology, Aristotle's conception of friendship will have to help him make sense of something he finds in Scripture. That's what you're doing when you're doing theology. Uh, in any case, uh, he is, he's using Aristotle to make manifest some truth he finds in, in the scripture. But before we go to that, there's an interesting puzzle I mentioned earlier that we should raise. Uh, if friendship, according to Aquinas, obtains just insofar as two persons uh, are wishing each other some good uh, and that they are sharing in the pursuit of this good uh, concretely, uh, what we might want to ask is the thing that friends want for each other. Now, this is not something you can find in Aristotle. This is, this is Aquinas. That's not a rhetorical question. Do you guys, does anyone have a guess? What do friends want for each other? You've got friends? Yeah. To be in God. To be in God? We'll get to that. That's a different kind of friendship than the, the very general sense that I'm, I'm talking right now. 
What do you, you have friends. What is it that you've been doing? What is it that you want for each other? Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Aquinas thinks, and I think rightly, that the thing that friends, and it's kind of odd, the thing that friends want most of all together and the thing that they most spend their time doing, the, and, and the, the, property, the most proper property of friendship is living together. It's, or we would say doing life together. What friends want for each other above all is their friendship. It's this, this you and i in. It's, it's this I and thou in, this togetherness, this thing that we're sharing, uh, this friendship that friends are so eager to pursue, to one, pursue together and very zealous to protect. Yeah? But Aristotle also says that. Does he say that? Yeah, I, th I think you have a hard time actually getting that air out of Aristotle. Aquinas gets it out of Aristotle, but it's, I think it's... Um, so there's a dispute here about whether or not a, that's the, whether Aristotle himself says that. I would be very pleased to see that he says that. Anyway, it's, it is what Aquinas says. Okay. All right, so that's the first piece of the show and tell. There's this, and there may be some questions about... about uh, this notion of friendship, but uh, the second thing to move on to is, is this notion that Aquinas gets, and he gets it from John chapter 15, verse 15. That's in the New Testament. It's one of the four Gospels, the 15th chapter, where Jesus says to his disciples, and by extension, uh, anyone uh, who, uh, ha who has the notion that they want to follow him, he says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Um, there's a sense in which, for Aquinas, that's pretty much, that's the heart of what Christians call the gospel. It's exceedingly good news. Um, and watch what Aquinas does here in the second passage when he goes on to uh, uh, describe this friendship that's being announced. Therefore, I'm in the second passage, since there is a particular fellowship between human beings and God, and this is gnomic, it's a bit obscure, we have to clarify it, but since there's a particular fellowship between human beings and God, insofar as he shares his happiness with us, upon this fellowship there must be founded some kind of friendship. This fellowship is mentioned in 1 Corinthians, God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his Son. Now the love which is founded on this fellowship is charity. Thus, it is evident that charity is a kind of friendship of man toward God. Uh, all right, let's take it together. Let's look at it together line by line. For the first thing uh, that Aquinas is, well, it's all wrapped up, isn't it, in this, this first line. He says, precisely because there is some sharing, some fellowship, some mutual pursuit, between human beings and God, uh, then there must be some kind of friendship founded on it. Uh, and we could, that's a bit unexpected, and, and um, you may have questions about that. In any case, uh, to understand what's being said here, we have to know uh, what it means here to say, as Aquinas does, that there is indeed some fellowship between human beings and God. Well, then he goes on to tell us, um, I'm, I'm talking here about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, when he says that God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his Son. Now, that word son there is a reference to Jesus of Nazareth. He's a first century rabbi, healer, prophet, uh, who was raised from the dead by the God of Israel and is... Um, this is the same Jesus of Nazareth who the church confesses uh, is the Son of God. And um, what's being said is that um, 
God in Jesus shares his happiness with us. Um, which is to say something like this. There is this friendship between human beings and God, and the thing that God wants for us is nothing less than his own happiness. Uh, what's that mean? Uh, that would take, we could talk about that, not, we could talk about that for a long time, but it, it at least means this, that what God wants for human beings and what God gives to human beings and, um, in a way yet to be explained in, in Christ is the fullness of his own perfect joy uh, in his eternal goodness. That's when, so when we read, for example, elsewhere in the New Testament that God is love, Aquinas is going to say, um, God loves human beings. To love is to wish someone some good. The thing that God wants for us is nothing less than God. Uh, but that's uh, not all that's being said in this passage, uh, because we know that for a friendship to obtain, there has to be some mutuality. And in fact, Aquinas thinks that, uh, that through the death and the life, death, resurrection, and ascension uh, of Christ, through the gift of the Holy Spirit and the sacraments of the church, uh, by grace, God makes it so that we can love God in turn. Uh, what is it that we want for God? I, I'll, I'll turn it over again. What is it that we want for God in, according to this picture? Yeah. Maybe just that a little bit. So Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you, so I would, so... Say more. Yeah, um, because it is infinite in God, and uh, according of sorry, according to our human convention and the human friendship, you do me a favor, I need to uh, do you a favor. If you love me, I love you back. And as Christ Himself command, just keep my commandment. And He also reinterpreted the commandment in His own way. Okay. Uh, well, the, the, this, this, the introduction of commands is, is, is really interesting, and maybe we can return to that in the, the Q&A. Um, Aquinas thinks that, in a sense, what we want for God I mean, we, is nothing less than ourselves. Uh, and if this is indeed a true friendship that attains between human beings and God, uh, we could put it another way. What it is that God wants for us is friendship with us. And when we say that we're loving God, we're saying that we want that same thing too. You see, this is the interesting thing about this thing called friendship that can be wanted, that one can will another. It's not something you can will for another without also willing it for yourself and vice versa. And what you're saying is, uh, insofar as you're saying that I love you, my friend, is that uh, I'm wanting our friendship for us. To say that is to say that I'm wanting uh, our relationship to endure, to go on. God is the principal object uh, of, this, of this love, but it extends in, in, a, in a very interesting way we can discuss toward others. Uh, And it's founded on this fellowship, as Aquinas calls it, this communicatio. And he, and I'm turn, I've turned the page over here just to show, that, and I'm showing that he can describe this fellowship or this togetherness in different kinds of ways. He can call it a fellowship of eternal happiness. Uh, there, what's being, uh, what's being brought into focus is the thing that God is wanting for us. He can call it a supernatural fellowship. There what's being brought into focus is uh, 
well, this earlier thing, bit that was mentioned in the previous talks about, uh, well, as Isaiah says, as you know, no eye has seen or ear has heard. I mean, th there's something about this friendship that uh, exceeds the capacities of human beings to, to conceive of or desire prior to its, um, its arrival in one's life by grace. Uh, that's the second thing I wanted to show. Is, so the first thing is just that Aquinas has this idea of friendship, and he thinks that it's this ordinary conception of friendship that we can recognize. Uh, I mean, if it's right, it had better actually make sense of our lives. Uh, it, we, we can see it more or less clearly uh, in our own friendships with, with one another insofar as they, um, this notion of friendship obtains in them. But then the second thing is, is that he thinks that this friendship, um, this notion of friendship maximally obtains in uh, a specific friendship called charity. And that's the second thing. The third thing is, uh, well, you know, I, I began reading Aquinas, I don't know how long ago, maybe 10 years ago, and I, this, and theology will do this to you, so you have to be careful, but um, you can become so enchanted by it, you can become so uh, ab absorbed in the, um, in the pairing of concepts and um, stringing up syllogisms and, you know, buffing everything out and making it shiny and seeing how it all holds together, and then you forget that uh, the whole point is that there's actually um, a, a lived reality that's being described in all this. Um, it's not just it's not just an idea that 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 lives in our heads. It's something that Aquinas thinks and and I I think is real, um, and and many others have thought the same thing. And I wanted to the last thing I want to show you here um, and. It's just that uh, Aquinas thinks that this isn't uh, this isn't just an artful contrivance of of medieval thought, but it's some it's something that human beings experience. So look here at this uh, passage, the first passage under the experience of charity here, on um, the second page. This is a uh, passage from the Commentary on Job. And Thomas is now describing, um, he's e or exegeting uh, Job's um, backward-looking appraisal of everything that he's lost. Thomas says, Then he recalls the goods from his past, and he begins with the greatest good, the divine intimacy which he felt in prayer. Hence he says, when God secretly used to dwell in my tent, he means, I used to feel the presence of God when I privately prayed and meditated in my tent. This belongs to contemplation. This has to do with contemplation. Uh, this notion of intimacy here, I. Is, is interesting. It could also be translated familiarity, uh, but that would only make sense if we can think about what it's like to be at home with, um, well, in the ideal case, one's family. Uh, the Apostle Paul in, uh, in the book of Romans says that, um, that uh, the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts, and by this we are made children of God. There's a kind of familiarity um, or intimacy uh, when, when familial friendships go the way we, they, we hope they do, that children feel um, in the presence of their father and mother. And Aquinas um, 
Now, he may be right or wrong about what Job is saying, but he is su suggesting here that if you read the book of Job, and when you get to the part where Job is, do is talking about God dwelling with him in his tent, what he's referring to here is a kind of intimacy, a kind of familiarity. Um, and it's something uh, uh, that can be experienced. It's real. Uh, I'll, I'll read one more passage, and then, um, and I think the second passage is, uh, is especially interesting if we return to the subject of positive psychology. I mean, positive psychology is about uh, uh, doing things that will cultivate um, uh, certain feelings and, and habits that will help you manage the world in a way that we um, deem best. However well or ill-conceived that notion of best is, that's what it's trying to do. Um, this next passage uh, is all about uh, fear, or rather the absence of fear. Or anxiety. Anxiety is a kind of fear. So here's what Aquinas says. Um, now, maybe you recognize this uh, this verse, you know, the one that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, when the psalmist says, taste and see how sweet, he's urging us toward an experience. I fell out of my chair the first time I, I read this passage. Uh, this is not the type of th um, thing that you typically associate with Aquinas. He's urging us toward an experience. He's exhorting us to experience dwelling together with God. Now, the experience of anything comes through the senses, but in different ways, depending on whether the object is close or at some distance. If it's close, then touch and taste come into play, but each in its own way. For touch senses the outside of the object, where taste senses the inside. Now, God is not far from us nor outside us, but rather He's in us. As Jeremiah 14 says, You are in us, O Lord. Incidentally, this is, uh, Aquinas thinks is actually true, uh, whether or not uh, you uh, know it, um, in this sense that God, uh, uh, well, according to Aquinas and classical theism more generally, is omnipresent, literally in all things, so in all things that it's, according to one of my um, Favorite Thomas Joseph Pieper, it's more proper to say that we are in God than God is in us. In all things. So that when you, so Augustine uh, or the psalmist says, where can I go, Lord? <laughs> where can I go where, where you're not there? Uh, God, according to Aquinas, um, is so, is so near us that um, we can say that God is in us. And then he goes on to say, thus the experience of divine good is called tasting, as it says in 1 Peter 2. But if you taste, how sweet. He's just giving us a little, a little bit of the passage. Next, he shows the effect of this experience. It's the security of love. Security here uh, means the absence of fear. Now, although when it comes to physical things, something is first seen and then tasted in among spiritual things, it's just the opposite. For one who does not taste does not know. Thus he says, first taste and then see. Uh, so it needs to be said that Thomas is using these words metaphorically, uh, but he's using them in such a way uh, to explain uh, what it could mean, as the psalmist says, to taste and see that the Lord uh, is good. Uh, this, uh, this goodness, this nearness, I'm suggesting, um, is for Aquinas uh, only explained uh, with reference to this conception of friendship that I've just described. Uh, 
Uh, one more passage. This seems to be especially proper friendship to live together with one's friend. Now the dwelling of man with God is through contemplation of him, just as the apostle says. Our conversation is in heaven. Since therefore the Holy Spirit makes us lovers of God, consequently we are made contemplators of God too. Now, I haven't said here much about what contemplation uh, consists in, and um, there's a lot that can be said about this. But um, minimally Aquinas is, uh, is saying, uh, first, we have this conception of friendship. Second, uh, there is this thing called friendship with God. And it's not just uh, an idea, but a lived reality and something that can be experienced uh, and experienced in, uh, in different kinds of prayer. Uh, my thought was that uh, any discussion of happiness uh, ought to in, at least put those ideas on the table. And then I wanted to know what you thought about them. Okay, so let's take some questions. Uh, yeah, I think you have to go to the microphone. Thank you very much for your talk. You know, I was wondering about uh, grace. It seems like in order to love God, uh, one must have the gift of grace. And I was wondering um, if that's true, if I'm right about that. But also, does God sometimes withhold grace? And if he does, is it still possible to, to love God without grace? So. Aquinas thinks that there's something called natural love for God. Um, have you ever read Aristotle's Metaphysics? You get to the 12th book and you find out that the, this first cause is the, is what? Uh, it's what moves all things by being loved by them? God. That's God. Um, I, I read this book a couple years ago with some freshmen here at Yale and they were so disappointed because they couldn't figure out what was so lovely about that. Um, we were reading Augustine the next week. I said, just wait. Um, uh, there is something good, isn't there, about this notion of a first cause. I mean, it's, it, it attracts us, Aristotle thinks. Um, it it's the founding, it's the motivating cause of his philosophizing. It's the thing he's trying to know. Uh, if you read Thomas's commentary on 1 Corinthians, he says the difference between the philosophers, he's spe speaking of the ancient philosophers and the prophets, is that um, they, they could arrive at some notion of this first cause, uh, but they were just scratching the surface. It was like an unknown, uh, well, as Thomas says, we are ordered to this, to God as an end unknown. Or in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, it says, God has put eternity into the hearts of men, yet not without our knowing uh, what this means. Something like that. Uh, so there's this kind of natural love that Aquinas thinks that is uh, this perfectly possible without grace and he thinks we see it all about uh, he thinks that the that friendship with god is yes it's always founded upon grace um, whether i whether god withholds grace um, from some is that the question yes does he withhold grace from some people well aquinas this is tough. You're asking me a tough question. And um, uh, a very traditional idea has been that uh, not everyone comes to love God uh, in the notion that's entailed in the friendship of charity. 
Um, how we explain uh, why that is, uh, there are different answers to this question. definition of friendship, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, seems to not include altruistic friendship, meaning that the one wishes uh, the other some good. One likes to, or um, uh, there's this community, this, this uh, mutual wishing good to each other. But what if a friend that we wish good to doesn't reciprocate? Oh, I see. Yeah. And, um, uh, <coughs> what sustains friendship in adversity, meaning if the friend is in adversity and is not wishing you good, and uh, so is, is that included in the definition of friendship or is it excluded? Can you repeat the second? The sec I have the first part down, but the second part, uh, you, can you take another pass at that? Altruistic friendship, meaning that if the friend is not reciprocating, yeah, but got it. just stick in there. Stay, you, know, you, you, keep, you push, you keep the friendship. Yeah, so that's where the condition of mutuality is important. You could have uh, one person wanting something for another, loving them. But without mutuality, you have something less than a friendship. You have a potential friendship. So I'm right in saying that it's excluded. It that doesn't, yeah. It, so it. Altruistic giving or friendship. Well, I, I, it excludes it, but I don't know. I'm not sure in which, which sense you mean. It, the claim isn't at all that. Um, Loving others who don't love us um, isn't something good. In fact, we have it on the authority of Scripture um, that uh, we're, we're actually commanded to love our enemies. So an enemy is someone who, by definition, um, is inimical to you. They, they, they don't want your good. Um, it's not a permanent sort of ontological category that someone falls in, but there are people who don't wish us well, who wish us ill. Uh, we're called to love them. Uh, we won't say uh, that we are friends with our enemies in the sense that I'm describing it here, uh, but, there's, but we will say that it's good to love them. We, we might even say something like, um, what we're wanting for our enemies, now here, so here's another thing we could add in. Jesus says um, in the Gospels, um, love one another, okay? Love God, one. Love one another. Now, uh, what is it that we're being commanded to want for others? Aquinas is going to come and say, it's charity. The good we're wanting for, other, we're, that we're wanting for others when we are loving even our enemies is that they would become friends of God. So there's a sense in which um, charity has this, it, this, there's this transitivity principle embedded in it. I mean, you come to love God and notice that we, we um, spontaneously love those whom our beloveds love. And so our, our love tends to, doesn't it, it tends to um, kind of fan out, right? I mean, you'll notice that uh, when you're, if you have children, when your children have children, you, you'll love them and it, it just, ha it, will, it'll, it will happen, right? Um, and so too, when you're, you have very good friends who have very good friends, um, they're, when everything's going as we hope it will, there's a tendency for these friendships to sort of to, to grow outward. Um, uh, charity ought to work like that, but because um, this is very um, difficult, uh, because this the impulse of charity clashes with our fragmented, fallen selves, we have to be 
commanded to do it. This probably needs to be the last question. Thank you. Uh, first is just a, a definitional clarification question. Uh, is there a difference between to will the good of another and to wish the good of another? D yeah. And then, and then uh, mm -hmm. so the second question is, if friendship is willing the good of the other, are there certain habits of mind or body that put one in a better position to will the good of the other and oh, yeah. to be a good friend? Yes. Yeah. There's so much buried in this talk, and you just surfaced a couple of real, uh, a couple of really great questions. The first one, uh, though, when I use the words wish and want, I'm using them very generally here to to get into English the same Latin term. I don't mean anything different by them. Uh, the second thing, the second question is really interesting, and there are two points I think that, that um, will help. Uh, the first is this. When we talk about friendship, we tend to think of it as something that kind of hovers between us. Like it's this, uh, this hard to describe thing that encapsulates us. We, and our, it, our grammar reflects this. Uh, Aquinas can talk this way, but he thinks more fundamentally what friendship is, is a habit. Uh, it is a, which is to say, it's a, um, st it's a sturdy disposition of the will to acts of a particular kind. Namely, acts of friendship. Um, you ask, though, are there habits of mind that facilitate uh, our being good friends? And the answer is uh, yes. In fact, uh, the kind of friendship that I began by describing for Thomas and Aristotle, too, many others besides, is only possible if you are virtuous. I mean, so those habits that you need in order to love well, those are the virtues. Uh, there's a different answer when it comes to the friendship of charity, because in Aquinas' view, um, God not only gives you charity, but all the virtues that you need in order to love well, they actually are born out of charity, but and then support it in different ways. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. 